Well, good morning. I can tell underneath your masks, everyone has a bright, smiling face this morning. Or at least give me a thumbs up to let me know that you're smile. Oh my goodness, it, it, it is so wonderful to be here with you, present at Sierra Bible Church, uh, here, uh, worshiping Jesus, studying his word, glorifying him in song, praising his name for all that he is, and it's just so wonderful to see all of you. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, just over a week ago, we, we challenged our congregation to uh, begin starting to think about what it's going to look like to gather once again in person. And one of the things that we challenged our people is as we knew that it was going to take a few steps before we were going to able to be able to all gather in one service all together yet again. So we, we challenged our congregation to have the attitude of, you can take my seat if you'd like. You can have my seat uh, because we have a, a 50 person restriction that, that only permits 50 people to gather on Sunday morning. So that means of a church between 200 and 250 that, that so many people this morning have sacrificed for your sake, for, for your benefit, and for your good. Uh, so, what I would like to do. What I would like to do as we're starting here is I'd like for us who are here, who are the beneficiaries of the sacrifice of others, to just look at that young man back there in the blue shirt. He's got a camera, and we are going to wave our wave of thank you to all of those who are participating with us at home and say thank you so much for allowing us to be here in person and worshiping all together. We love you, we're with you, and we are so thankful that you have uh, sacrificed for others so that we might gather here together this morning. So this morning is kind of our test run, our trial run of 50 people gathering, and it is going so far so good. Wonderful to see all of your faces. Wonderful to praise and worship Jesus along with you. And uh, next week, we are going to have this same service at 9 o'clock, so we can't wait to see you next Sunday at the very same time. But we're also going to be adding an 11 o'clock service for 50 more people to be gathered and worshiping Jesus together. And if you are listening at home and you would like to participate in that service next week, make sure that you are uh, communicating with a pastor or a shepherd, and we would love to reserve a seat for you next Sunday where we can worship together. While dad, uh, gathering digitally for a time is necessary and, and was necessary, uh, we are just so thankful that we can gather together in person. Uh, the, the term church means, it, the derivative of the word is assembly. It means assembly. The, the people of God gathered together in an assembly. So while digital services are great for a time period, there's no such thing as a local church that does not gather in person. And we would love to continue to make progress towards meeting in person to meet the spiritual needs of our congregation and our city as we are moving forward. We just have this service this morning and then next, next service uh, next week, the two services next week, and we will be finishing out the book of Joshua. We've been in Joshua since the very beginning of 2020. We are fin in the last chapter this morning. We're going to get to most of the chapter this week and then wrap up the highlights next week. So if you have a Bible with you, you can open it to Joshua chapter 24. Uh, and as you are opening jo to Joshua chapter 24, uh, I, I want to read a couple of the comments along the lines of, people who uh, have responded said to what to the opening question the opening question being how long how, how did your longest friendship begin uh, one this is a really good one by daniel says that he met his wife on a twister board with a girl named susan i was like man they were destined to be married if they, they meet for the very first time playing twister 
Uh, a couple of others here. Uh, Gary says that, or, or Vivi, excuse me, uh, says that uh, her, one of her longest friends was a co-leader in Bible study fellowship with the children's department. Uh, Jake says that he met Dawn on a blind date uh, from our mutual friend Tiffany Sh Tiffany's house, and they were they were they have been now married seven years. Tomorrow, uh, Phil says that he met his longest friendship on the volleyball court in Yuma, Arizona, in the fall of 1982. I'm not going to tell you when I was born, with that number being thrown out there. Uh, I, as I think about longest-term friendships, usually what happens when people are become friends is they are doing an activity or they're, they're participating in something and they kind of have this aha moment where they look at each other and say, oh, you too? I thought I was the only one. I remember one of my longest friendships comes with a friend that I had in high school that we met on the soccer field, and as we were playing soccer, we began talking about skiing, and in Wisconsin, there aren't very many skiers growing up. So we kind of looked at each other and said, wait, you too? You ski as well? C.S. Lewis has this great quote about friendship saying this, friendship arises out of mere companionship when two or more companions discover that they, have in, that they have in common some insight or some interest or even taste which the others do not share, and which, till that moment, each believed to be his own unique treasure or burden. The, the typical expression of opening friendship would be something like, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. It is when two such persons discover one another when, whether the, with immense difficulties and semi-articulate fumblings or with what would seem to us amazing and elliptical speed, they share their vision. It is, they, sh they share their vision. It is then that friendship is born. And instantly, they stand together in an immense solitude. What? You play soccer too? I thought I was the only one. What? You knit and crochet also? I thought I was the only one. What? You're a World War II veteran also? I thought I was the only one. And it's in those moments where we are permitted an intense, an immense solitude, a bond of solitude. At the conclusion of the book of Joshua, Joshua wants to bring people into an immense solitude and friendship with God, an enduring bond that will last far longer than even Joshua's life. As Joshua passes away, the, he wants the people to know that they have an immense bond and friendship with God. Joshua, if you want to summarize the entire message in just a sentence, it's this. It's friendship with the Lord. Friendship with God it isn't just simply a one-time decision, but it endures through an, a whole life commitment. And Joshua is calling the nation of Israel to this type of friendship. He first highlights their, their friendship, the, the God's uh, interaction with the Israel and bringing people to himself, and then he see, we see the people's response to God. Now, now, this season has revealed many things about our world, about our nation, about us as individuals. This season has brought out so many things within us during this year. If we were to go around and begin sharing all of our experiences of what we've learned and the hardships we've endured and all of the things that we have gone through during this season that we are still experiencing right now, we could be here for the rest of the day. 
But one of the things that I believe God is bringing out of his church during times like this and during a time like this is so important for us to understand that it comes out of this text. And it's this, we need each other. We need human interaction. We need uh, community and interaction with one another and friendship with one another. But what we've also learned through this is as much as we need interaction and friendship and, and camaraderie with one another, we need a friendship and a relationship with God himself. We need to have the deepest amount of friendship with God that can endure for us through the most difficult circumstances of life. We hope that you are building meaningful relationships here at Sierra Bible Church. We hope that there's this longing inside of those who are here and those who cannot be gathered here physically with us. We hope that there is this longing to say yes and amen. Let's gather together, worship Jesus, and meet again with our friends and family members at Sierra Bible Church. But we don't just want you building strong relationships with one another here. We want you building strong, sturdy relationships with God at the individual and corporate level. In, in verse 1, Joshua is beginning to address the entire nation as he is about to depart and he's about to die and he has the entire nation come and gather before God for worship when the entire nation is gathered together, uh, Joshua begins to prophesy. He begins to speak the words of God to the people of God that are gathered in verse 2. And he begins by highlighting where the people used to be, the, the long history of Israel's past. He goes way back to Abraham and, and, and recalls to mind, God recalls to mind, hey, remember your ancestor Abraham. Before he came to where, his descendants came to where you guys are living now, I, God, called him out of his polytheism, called him out of his paganism, called him out of worshiping other gods that, were, that he was just going about his business. And I called him out of that place, and I promised to give him a land of Canaan. I brought him into the land of Canaan, and then he had a promised son, even though he was really, really old, named Jacob excuse me, named Isaac. And then Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Esau went, and went into the hill country and Jacob went down into Egypt. E the, then in Egypt, all of my people were enslaved to the Egyptians and I rose up Moses and Aaron and I delivered them from slavery with mighty signs and powers and wonders. And then I led them out of Egypt and I led them into the wilderness for a long time. I love how... God just summarizes it in, in one simple sentence. One, one simple sentence in, uh, <laughs> at the end of verse 7. And you lived in the wilderness a long time. Like, that's all he says. Can you imagine? And you were under COVID-19 restrictions a long time. <laughs> and some of you are like, no, it's been 122 days. You, you had the exact number of days, months, years of, that you've been in it. And God is just like, You've been, you were in the wilderness a long time. But then I brought you into the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you and I gave them into your hand. You took possession of the land and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zephor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Beor, uh, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you, so I delivered you out of his hand. You went into the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the leaders of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Sparksites and the Renoites and the... Uh, just making sure you're listening. Uh, the, and the Jebusites, and I gave them into your hand, and I sent the hornet before you, and they drove, and which drove them out before you. The two kings of the Amorites 
And then here's the whole point of what God is trying to communicate at the end of verse 12 and moving into verse 13. This is what the heart of what God wants to communicate about his friendship to Israel, his relationship to Israel. He says this, It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and the olive orchards that you did not plant. God is saying clearly to his people as they're all gathered together, I initiated my relationship with you. I started this whole thing by calling out Abram. I did all of the signs and wonders in Egypt to lead them into the wilderness. I drove out all of the other peoples. I gave you lands that you did not deserve. I started and initiated all of this. Uh, One of the longest friendships of my life is with my wife. I like her. I think things things are going well. Uh, she's not here this morning, but she did give me permission to share this uh, story with you. Uh, if I kind of, before my, her senior year, my junior year of college, we both kind of knew of each other, but we didn't really know each other. We weren't really friends in a meaningful way. And one night, uh, one night she was known for being cautious. Uh, she doesn't really like a ton of risk. She likes safety. She, li- she likes having things planned and calculated and everything, kind of all of her ducks in a row and everything taken care of. I'm not like that. My risk tolerance is rather high, and uh, I ga- steadily gained a reputation, especially in college, of being rather spontaneous. In fact, I gained a reputation as the guy who randomly would jump in bushes and slide across open fields when it was raining. Uh, because it's fun, and why wouldn't you? If they, you see an entire field full of puddles, why in your right mind would you not say, let's go stomp in that puddle? Let's go slide in that puddle. There's grass there. There's puddles there. Why would we waste time uh, just walking around the puddle when you can slide right on through it? So that was my reputation in college, and Andrea's reputation was a little bit different, but I knew something was a little bit different, and we were moving into the realm of friendship when after a student event happened in the student center one evening, uh, Andrea came up to me, it was raining outside, and she comes up to me and says, you want to go slide in some puddles? I was like, you? Want to slide? You know I'm down. So she had it all prepared. She had her dirty, you know, her raggy clothes on. She was ready to go. I was just in my formal attire and said, all right, let's go. And I, I'm kidding. It wasn't in formal attire. I was just in normal street clothes. And we slid around in the mud and in the grass for a number of times. Isn't it interesting how f- human friendships, there, there needs to be both this mutual rep, 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 reciprocity. There we go. I'll get it. And Jacob, why can't you just edit this out on the fly for me, buddy? Uh, There needs to be this reciprocity of initiative. There needs to be an understanding of who the person is. There needs to be an understanding of who the other person is. And there needs to be kind of this give and take of saying, I'll go this far, you go this far, and, and then friendship can kind of begin. In our relationship with God, it's not mutually initiated. 100% of our relationship is initiated by God. God is the one who communicates his word. God is the one who chases after the one and leaves the 99. God is the one who leads his people into the promised land after the wilderness. God is the one who says, I am your God and you are my people. Come and follow me. God is the one who always initiates the relationship with all of his people. Can you think through, in your mind this morning, can you think through how God, through his word, in the person of Jesus Christ, 
initiated his relationship to you, initiated his friendship with you. Can you think back to the day, moment, season, or time inside of your life when God came through spiritually into your heart and told you in a very personal way, I want a relationship with you. I sent my son to die for you, to be rose from the dead from you, because I love you and I want a relationship with you. Can you remember the time in which that season happened? One of my favorite things that have happened through the season of COVID-19 is leading up to Easter, we invited a number of our people to share their story, how God initiated a relationship with them. And there online, we had hundreds and hundreds of views of videos from people uh, from Sierra Bible Church testifying that Jesus had saved them and has initiated a relationship to them. Can you think of the time when God initiated a relationship to you? Can you rehearse it in the same way that God communicated to Israel? This is how I initiated my relationship to you, Israel, and brought you to myself. Can you communicate that and be able to communicate that in a simple way that other people can can understand? Can you share that message of how God initiated his relationship with you in a way that that people can hear and receive and know that, yeah, God is a good God and he has initiated a relationship with you. Perhaps God might be initiating a relationship with me. Now, some of you here, you might not have a friendship with God, a relationship with with God. As I say these things, like, can you remember when God initiated a relationship with you? You're like, no, I I can't. I can't think of a time when God initiated a relationship with me, when God desired to bring me into friendship with him. I can't pinpoint a time. Well, I have good news for you. If you are here this morning and you are hearing this message from the scripture, you perhaps are hearing the voice of God to your soul. That God, this morning, might be initiating a relationship with you. That God might be bringing you to himself to show you that, that his friendship is far better than any other human friendship that you could possibly have. That his relationship is initiated by him and that he brings himself to you and that he will keep you not only just for this age but also for the age that is to come. And you will be with him forever. Perhaps some of you who are here are hearing this, and God, through his word, is initiating a friendship. He's drawing you to himself. Well, if that's you, what are you supposed to do? How do you respond to the initiation that that God makes on behalf to his people? Well, what do you do? How do you respond to that? How How do you even begin to fathom the fact that the God who created everything is initiating a personal relationship? That seems awfully overwhelming to think through the details of what that might look like. Well, we see it exactly in the response that Joshua gives to the people and how they are respond how they were to respond to the God of Israel in their day, starting in verse 14. Joshua says this, in the aftermath, in the aftermath of, in the aftermath of God's initiation to his people, Joshua says this, This is how you are to respond when God is working, when God is moving, when God is drawing you to himself. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. This is the Old Testament way of saying, put your trust in God. This is the Old Testament way of saying, don't fear anything else other than the Lord, Yahweh, the God who is drawing you to himself. If you hear God's voice initiating a friendship to, with you, your proper response is the same response as the, in the Old Testament, is you say to him, I trust you. I put my faith in you. I put my hope in you. I put my security in you. I put my life into your hands. And that's where he goes next. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. 
That means in the depths and the recesses of your own heart, if you hear God's word and you say in sincerity, God, I trust you. God, I place my hope in you. God, I, I don't, I'm not trusting in my money. I'm not trusting in my family. I'm not trusting in my ability to stay healthy. I, I'm trusting in you. I, in sincerity, before you, put all of my trust and faith in you. You serve him in faithfulness. You respond with service and faith. And how does that look practically? Well, in the Old Covenant, and even today, it means this. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. So have no other thing in your life higher than the voice of God, higher than the relationship that you have with God. Verse 15. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, say, no, actually, I, I kind of like the other gods more than you, Yahweh. I kind of like my family more than you. I kind of like my job more than you. I kind of like all of these other things more than you. If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Joshua puts them to a decision. This is clear that God has taken the initiative with you. Look at all of the things that God has done for you. If you want to turn back and you want to go back and serve anything else, now's the time to go back. Choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Ammonites or in the gods in whose land in whom you dwell. Then Joshua says, courageously, boldly, strongly, in accordance with his character throughout this entire book, but as for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. The other peoples can do whatever they want with whatever gods that they want. The other families can go serve and do whatever they want with however they want to do it. But as for me personally and my house, those that I'm responsible for, we are going to serve the Lord. That's a great passage. That's a great passage to like put on the doorpost of your house. It's a great passage to put on the wall or a sign to, so that everybody can know. It doesn't need to be overt or bold. It doesn't need to be in large print, but it does need to be the declaration of, of your heart and of your life. I don't care what everybody else does. I, I, I'm not really concerned with how my neighbors order their house, as appealing or as unappealing as it may be. What I'm concerned with is me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is, oh, can I just pause and just say, it's so nice to hear an amen. <laughs> it is so nice to hear an audible amen and not just a chuckle from Pastor Cassidy. <laughs> As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. This is what happens to the heart that responds to the initiative that God has made to bring someone into fellowship and friendship with himself. They say, man, this friendship that I have with you, God, is so much greater than all of the other relationships that are offered to me. The promises that you make in your scripture about who I am and about what you're, you have done for me and about who you are, that I get to have a relationship with you, is so much greater. Why would I even pretend to want to serve anything higher than you? You're my God. You have saved me, and you have initiated this relationship to me. So Joshua puts it all on the table before the people. It says, if you want to turn back and go back into and serve your other gods, now is the time to do that. He puts the decision for them. But if you want to be a part of Israel, if you want to be a part of God's people, as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, it must have been a pretty either convicting speech or stirring speech, or they must have heard the words of God in some capacity, because look at how the people answered in verse 16. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord, Yahweh, our God, who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who did those great signs in our midst and preserved us in all of the way that we went, and among the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove 
out before us all of the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, here's the conclusion, therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. God must have been stirring and working inside of the people's heart because collectively, all together, as individuals, they said, we're in. We don't want to go back and serve the other gods. We don't want to serve the gods of the Ammonites. We don't want to serve Molech or Baal or Asherah. We desire to serve the Lord. And Joshua, he's a wise leader. He knows that he, can, that he can whip people into a frenzy with an impassioned speech. He knows that he can lead a rally of people and get people to an emotional decision to say, yeah, all right, let's decide. We're going we're gonna to follow Yahweh and be friends with him. But he knows that it's not just a one-time decision. When you pledge your life to Yahweh, when you respond to God's grace in, by, by faith, it, it's not just this one-time, one-moment thing. It's a whole life commitment. So Joshua presses in like the good leader that he is in verse 19. But Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. Then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done good to you. In other words, he's saying, like, you can't go half-hearted into this. Like, if you think you can just be in it, in the friendship with God, just for the benefits that God will give and not put everything before him, that's not a real relationship. That's not what God is calling you to. If you want to be in, you have to be all in, all of your life before him not just part, and you can't hold back and worship other gods in other areas. you got to be 100% all in in your relationship to God. And the people said to Joshua, no, we understand. We will serve the Lord. Verse 22. Joshua then is convinced. Then you are witnesses against yourself and that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. In other words, publicly, you guys are all in this together. You guys are all making this commitment. You guys can all see one another. You guys can all know one another. You're all making this public profession of faith. Everybody knows everyone is in it wholeheartedly. You're witnesses against yourself that you've chosen to serve the Lord. And they said, they affirmed, we are witnesses. And he said, then put away the foreign gods, That are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord, our God, we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put it put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. Shechem was the place where they were worshiping Yahweh at that time. Joshua wrote all of these words in the book of the law of God. And then he took large stones that are much larger than these ones here, and he put them into a place. Imagine these things are extremely large. He took, large, he took a large stone, and he set it up there under the terebinth that was in the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. It has heard all of the words that he has spoken to us. Therefore, it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. And then Joshua sent the people away, every man to his his inheritance. So it's almost as if Joshua took a large stone, set it up in the place in Shechem, and placed the words of God on that stone. Wrote it down in the book of the law, placed it on the stone, and says, this stone is a witness that you have made a pledge to continue to serve Yahweh in faithfulness and fidelity and faith. So what do we learn from this? We learn from this that the witness of whether we are following Jesus, whether we are following Yahweh, whether we are following God or not following God is not just our feelings, but it's in God's word. 
God's word is the witness that testifies whether we are in or whether we are out. God's word is the one that will convict us if we are being led astray and, and following something other than God, and it brings us back into relationship with him once again. The only thing that we need to, to grow spiritually before God and have a witness that testifies whether we are in or whether we are out are, is our life responding to God in his word with faith. Are we pledging ourselves to say, yes, everything that God has said, we will follow and we will walk out. We will respond to your gracious initiative, God, with faith. I love performing wedding ceremonies. They're one of my favorite things to do as a pastor. Uh, but do you know what part of the, the wedding ceremony is the climax the, the high point that everybody really digs in on. Some might think, oh, it's the kiss, you know, the kiss and everybody cheers. You know? Others might think, no, it's the, when the bride enters and everybody's, oh, she's so beautiful. Others, like myself, believe it's when the pastor gives his words. <laughs> and people really dig in. But it's not the bride coming down the aisle. It's not the groom standing on, uh, on the platform awaiting the bride. It's not even the music that perhaps is sung beautifully. When everybody gets on the edge of their seat, when everybody leans in and listens to everything that is going on, the, the climax of the wedding ceremony, and this has been attested to every wedding that I have officiated, when everybody's eyes get wide or just start sobbing, is when the bride says her vows to the groom and the groom says his vows to the bride. The vows are publicly what they are witnessing to honor and obey, to love and to cherish, to have and to hold in sickness and in health till death do us part. And it's those vows that they are pledging to one another in faith and in faithfulness in response to the other person's love that keeps their commitment secure. And it's those vows that they need to continue to rehearse in their minds to say that this is what I have pledged my life to. This is who, what my role is in ensuring that this relationship continues. Now make the translation. God has done everything imaginable to init not only initiate a relationship with you, but also to secure a relationship with you through the death of his son on the cross. To cleanse you from all of your impurity, all of your unrighteousness, all of the things that would separate you from a relationship with him, Jesus went the extra mile to love, initiate, forgive, and secure his relationship to you. So if there were to be a hypothetical, a metaphorical wedding ceremony between God and his people, the vows would all be one way. I promise to love you. I promise to keep you. I promise to have you. I promise to hold you. For better or for worse, until death do us part. And our response is simply turning to him and saying, I do. I do. I trust you. I trust that your word is true. I will turn away from all other gods and be devoted entirely to you. And God says, well, I have already taken the initiative and I will keep and, keep and secure this relationship. So brothers and sisters, as we're wrapping up this book of Joshua that compels us to be strong and courageous, know that this message of being strong and courageous is in accord with the initiative and the empowerment that God has made due to his relationship with you. And if you don't have a relationship with God, you can begin one this morning by simply praying along with me because God has initiated in and through his word to begin a relationship with you.
So regardless of where you're at, if you've been walking with Jesus and you can remember crystal clear when he initiated with you long ago, or if today is the, going to be the very first time that you begin a relationship with him, we're going to pray together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your people that are gathered here to remember the covenant that you have made with your people in and through Christ, to remember the, the one-way vow to secure this marriage, spiritual marriage between us and you. We thank you that, that our response is to say, I do, and to commit ourselves to you. But God, you will uphold us, you will strengthen us, and you will help us to continue throughout all of our days. And God, just as I'm praying now, Perhaps some in this room have never responded to the initiative that you have taken in and through your word. So I pray now, just as I am praying with heads bowed and eyes closed, that if there are those here that have not responded to your initiative, that would like to take that step this morning, they would like to say in the deepest recesses of their heart, I, I trust the Lord and I fear him only. I, I pray, God, that you would help them to pray these words. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. And I have disobeyed your commands. I have followed other things. But God, in your grace and in your mercy, you have pursued me in Jesus Christ. And I've, I hear your word speaking to me now. And I now put my faith in you and in your word. Please forgive me for my sin. Please walk with me for the rest of my life. Please secure my relationship to you. Knowing that this walk with you isn't a one-time decision but a whole life commitment. We thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, for your grace. And I thank you for your forgiveness. And also, Heavenly Father, for those of us who have been walking with you here for a number of years, who have been enduring through a difficult season of pain and grief and heartache and anxiety, and difficulty and being removed from human interaction, God, I, I pray that you would just give a, a fresh empowering of your grace, a fresh security of your commitment to us to uphold us and keep us and to keep us strong as we turn our lives once again to you saying that it's all for you. And Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for being our God and doing for us what we could not do for ourselves and initiating this relationship with you. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen.